Virginia's Roger Hanshaw, and he joins us now. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. How are you, sir? Gentlemen, good morning. I'm well. I have a, a, another legal mind in the building, too, here with Joe Ferretti, who is also an attorney at law. But he tells me your paths have not crossed, even though you're both longtime attorneys in the state. I, I think that's right. Yeah, I think I think Roger's been very busy trying to run the state, and I just do my little thing here in Martinsburg. So, yeah. <laughs> but no, we have, we, we all not... just do our part wherever we are. Well, uh, and Roger, I, I know that uh, uh, I, I'm sure your legal background has come uh, in handy for you uh, quite often in your role here in West Virginia. Rob, I, you know, I'm... it's an interesting time in the legislature. So we we actually think back over the the history of that body in our state, and there was a time when it was largely dominated by the practicing bar here in West Virginia. But really, today we're in a place where yeah. we we don't we 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 have a few enough number of lawyers that we actually don't even have one on every committee we have in the House now. It's uh, it's 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 one of the lowest percentages makeup of of lawyers certainly since I've been watching the legislature, and, and perhaps ever. That's interesting. Bill, what were you about uh, to yeah, say? Yeah, we, uh, we have a couple of lawyers today, and we also have a very interesting uh, incident or event that's going to happen this Friday, and that's with the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And it's my understanding that there is a constitutional issue involved here, a tug-of-war between the, the courts and judiciary. Uh, oh, excuse me, not the uh, judiciary and Congress. So, uh, uh this would be an excellent opportunity to get your thoughts of what is the issue here. Well, I think Roger will agree uh, that this is a very important interest, uh, a matter of interest for the state of West Virginia. And uh, Congress recently uh, tweaked some laws to make sure that uh, this pipeline gets built uh, after years of challenging uh, challenges in the court system. Yet here we are again with the Fourth Circuit weighing in and wanting to have a hearing on, um, I guess, uh, again, some environmental issues that have been raised w with the uh, rest of the pipeline that needs to be laid. And the interesting question is, uh, can Congress really tweak the law in such a way that court review is, is uh, no longer available? And uh, it's a, it's a, it is a constitutional matter, and uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how that is ultimately resolved. Roger, your thoughts? Oh, there's the, you. You could you could talk an hour on this, guys. This is this is a fascinating area of law. So if uh, if you think just about the legal implications of this case, I, this this is going to end up, I'm certain, back before the Supreme Court as a as a fully briefed case. It's it's pending before Justice Roberts right now on on motions to stay the action of the Fourth Circuit in this case. And uh, Joe's Joe's laid out well, I believe the 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 really. Because the crux of the legal question here which is, which is, can Congress dictate the outcome of pending federal litigation through passage of, of a piece of legislation? And the, the generally held answer to that, with, 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 with a lot of nuance, of course, but the, the generally held answer to that is no. Congress, Congress cannot do that absent a change in the substantive law that underlies the case. So one of the real questions here is, did Congress actually make a change to the substantive law? I was, I was actually flipping through some of the amicus briefs that were filed in this case by various parties just this morning, including a, a number of West Virginians. So all of our members of Congress, Governor Justice, uh, Attorney General Morrissey, uh, have, have all weighed in on this case as, as filers of amicus briefs in the court here. It, it is important to the state of West Virginia for sure, uh, but uh, this this provision of law, I'm afraid, is probably going to head back to the full court. Interesting, yeah, interesting perspective. Uh, I think it will be interesting if you're if you're a, an academic at heart. It's a fascinating question of of constitutional interpretation. Let's talk about the EMS bills that the state might be considering going forward. Uh, Roger, and I know in discussing items with local delegates regarding EMS. There is a concern because of the nature of the growth counties of the eastern panhandle, specifically Berkeley and Jefferson, that this is a bill that's got to be written right so the money is distributed uh, fairly uh, in, in a way that uh, doesn't hurt Berkeley or Jefferson County specifically. Looking, looking, uh, what, yeah. what's, what, what's the question, Rob? Sorry. Uh, yeah, in, in regards to constructing that legislation... I know this was oh, sure. legislation so that was halted got, before the last session. Right ended. up to midnight during the regular legislative session this year in March, it was it was the last. It was literally the last bill pending. 
before the two bodies adjourned on the last night of the session. I think there's a pretty wide consensus that we'd like to get this bill done as quickly as possible. Now, how we structure it is we're picking we're picking back up there which is where we left off in March and I think there I think there is some wisdom in considering how we how we distribute any proceeds that get that get sent out around the state so I, I think it's probably not too different from say the school funding formula for example where we have as one of our strategies building not just for current demand of students but for projected future population of, of students in an area when we set about to build a school. It, it probably shouldn't be much different than that when we think about how we resource up our, our, our EMS and volunteer fire department apparatuses around the state. So I, I, I think it's not, uh, not unreasonable to have that conversation at all. In fact, we're having it now. How is the money currently distributed under the the system that's in play now? Does does 100% go to the state, or is there a certain amount that's held back locally before it gets sent to the state? I, I believe it's the former. I, I believe that years ago there was a 1% tax on insurance premiums in West Virginia during some times when we were in a more more disastrous financial situation. A portion of that money got shunted elsewhere, and now it's down to to uh, I believe it's 0.55 percent of that that collection that gets that gets distributed out around the state to EMS and volunteer fire departments, but I, I believe it does not take into account the kind of differential in in demand or differential in need that, that you're talking about here, Rob. So mm -hmm. that that was where we left off in March was a conversation around that very question and if we get back to this bill sometime this summer i expect that's where we'll pick back up bill former county commission president your thoughts on this distribution well a couple questions uh question first uh do all the counties have a fire fee and an ambulance fee or do you know mr speaker uh i i think the answer to that question admiral is no uh, I, I i want to put an asterisk on that and say i've not looked at all 55 counties but the counties in which I have personal experience, I believe the answer to that question is no. That's also my impression that they do not. So, I've heard the same. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, as far as distribution, uh, the money is for obviously for equipment. Uh, it's also for insurance and medical as well, but no salaries. Is that correct? Uh, money's from the state. Well, that's how we left it in March. Now, whether that remains what's What's contained in any bill we'd take back up again is, is an open question, but that's how we left it in March. Yeah. Uh, so going back to the fees, uh, uh, Berkeley uh, and uh, and I think Jefferson to some degree and Morgan do the same thing, uh, has been very aggressive, very active, recognizing that the, vol in the on the fire side, the volunteers are insufficient to handle them, uh, handle all the calls themselves. They need to be supplemented and augmented uh, by some paid staff. And as in Berkeley's case, we're migrating more and more toward the paid staff on the on the fire side. Uh, should not that be a consideration as well when you go through this distribution of funds, how well the county are trying to take care of themselves uh, with some help but not total reliance on the state? Oh, it already is. For sure and for certain there's a differential between uh, areas that have paid fire companies or even the hybrid model. So we, we have a growing number of communities that have I think, Admiral, the hybrid model you're describing right here, which is that we have we have some paid full-time uh, members of the department who are there just to make sure we have a basal level of coverage, but then we still have a substantial number of people who participate as volunteer volunteer firefighters. Uh, that that's absolutely a part of the consideration here. We we spent some we spent significant time on that, in fact, on our committee in fire and EMS during the regular session and then they've spent more time on it since then they actually held a full hearing on this bill 
the last time the legislature met remotely, which was in May back in Huntington. Our committee on fire departments and EMS heard testimony on, on that very question. Yeah, we're, this is uh, this problem is similar to other problems the state has. Uh, certain counties are fairly wealthy; other counties are less so. Locality pay is a function of this. Uh, how do you, looking at it from a more global sense, looking at the locality pay, fire, and I'm sure the other issues as well? How do you tackle this problem of the haves and the have-nots? So to be clear about this, I live smack dab in the middle of the state, right? I live in Clay County, which is absolutely right in the center of the state. Uh, I can go weeks at a time without ever leaving the borders of the state of West Virginia. And that's just a fundamentally different situation than 60% of West Virginians who live on a border county and might cross the border three or four times a day during the course of just normal life, right? So. Uh, the, the starting point here has to be a realization that despite our relatively small size as a state, we're, we're quite a diverse state in terms of how our people interact with our neighboring states. So despite the fact that I live right in the middle of West Virginia, I've always been a supporter of some form of locality pay, and I still am, for a couple different reasons. Well, first of all, I recognize that we've got a, we've got a staffing and shortage problem in a number of key areas in some of the higher income, higher growth regions of West Virginia. But we also have a problem on the complete other end of that bell curve. So if you take some of the absolute most depressed counties in West Virginia, you also see that same problem mirrored in those areas as well. So the, 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 if, if, you, if you plot a, a curve of problem versus affluence, for example, you'd find it to be largely symmetrical for different reasons, but nevertheless a symmetry. So I, I'm actually a supporter of some concept of locality pay, but I think we have to define it in terms of the need and the demand, not just simply in terms of the geography. And I think we end up in the same place there, but we address the problem on both ends of that bell curve. Well, the problem... Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it, it, yeah it makes yes, sense. Yes, it does. It yeah, does. You, yes. I, I agree with you. You can't be confined to defining it in terms of geography, but uh, if you look at demand for locality pay, I think it's a, a, a person would be able to articulate a reason for locality pay in just about every county in the state of West Virginia. Uh, and that's the problem, isn't it? That, that, that every county is going to have a reason that they need to have more money coming to their county to keep employees there or to attract employees well but now we're talking about two different things right so now we're talking about global increase in salary as opposed right. to salary differential that's where you end up right so yeah. the, the the there's never an argument from anybody about a need for additional compensation for state workers there there uh, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you I, I i am a former state worker and my wife is a school teacher here in west virginia and our state workers and public school teachers do some of the most important jobs we have in the state and are still underpaid, despite the fact that we've done a lot of, of, of pay raises here over the last five or seven or so years. They're still underpaid. And I say that as, as someone who used to work in those jobs. Um, but now that said, the argument's never about whether the state workers writ large deserve more money. Uh, we're, all, we're all for that. The, the question becomes... Do we as a state need to pay particular workers in particular areas at a different rate than we pay the same job elsewhere? That's the rub. Well, and Roger, in your position, I think it's important to, that we try to get uh, as many topics before you as we can because, uh, you know, you're, you're the head of the government and we need to know uh, what you're thinking and along these lines. And, and one issue that uh, I seem to be focusing on a little bit here now is higher education policy and funding uh, between our universities and the state government. We're starting to see little cracks in the foundation in terms of our universities here in West Virginia, all the way from WVU down to some of the smallest schools, such as Aldous and Broadus, uh, which is frankly hanging on by a thread, as it appears. What, what's the role of state government in terms of uh, funding towards some of these universities to keep them afloat if necessary and to keep them as options for a state that uh, continues to lag in terms of college attainment? I think we absolutely have an obligation to make sure that we're meeting the demand of West Virginians first. That's our primary obligation. 
and I'll, I'll stand by that all day long, that there's no better investment that we as a state can make than investments into the infrastructure and institutions of higher education. I think you can, you can look at that from several different lenses and reach the same conclusion. It's important for individual West Virginians because we all know that in 21st century America, that's how you advance as a citizen, it's through education. It's also important through the lens of government itself because if we talk about trying to do any kind of economic advancement here in West Virginia, the training of a workforce is absolutely critical and it's a baseline expectation of everybody we talk to now from a recruitment perspective. So there's a, there's a need for a, a vibrant public education system at every level. But here, here's, here's what we have to expect of the colleges and universities themselves, and it's been, a, it's been a good several months here of conversation that we've had with the leaders of the higher education systems. We, we need the leaders of the systems to be constantly assessing what the structure of their own institutions needs to be and responding and reacting to that all the time. So we, we, sh we shouldn't necessarily look to evaluate the health and fitness and suitability of our institutions just in times of crisis. So all of our institutions, I think, right now are engaged in some level of, of internal review, so to speak, about what should, their what should their structure be to meet what they believe the demand to be to serve the needs of West Virginians. I think the legislature it will, will be responsive when the time comes for us to step in at whatever level and in whatever way we're asked to step in. We, we, we've not yet been, and I think, I think that's the right course of action. Let's first look at what the structure of the institutions needs to be and should be, and then we'll respond accordingly as, as the state with, with the resources to make that, make that happen. Could I, uh, picking up on that, uh, Mr. Speaker, when you, uh, the health of the institutions, are you looking at them individually or looking at them as a group? Well, I think you always look at them individually. I, I think I think we have to always look at them individually, and, and there's a couple key reasons why I say that. So all of our institutions in West Virginia should play should play different roles. So we're we're a small enough state that you even 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 to drive from the furthest to, to drive from Harpers Ferry to Huntington, you can still do that in half a day. That's that's it's not like we live in Texas where it's 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 a day and a half drive across the state. So one of the things that our, our institutions has, have voluntarily done sort of by working together is that they've engaged in substantial mission differentiation to make sure that they're filling needs individually on behalf of the state rather than competing head-to-head -head with each other and, and diluting resources. So, for example, if we take the, 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 the two largest well, the, the two university-based medical schools in West Virginia, we set the osteopathic school aside momentarily and focus just on the Marshall Medical School and the WVU Medical School. They have, absent direction from us, they have on their own carved out niche areas of specialty and specialization in which they're doing important work on behalf of the people of the state without duplication. And that's really important to us because if we think about how we maximize our return on resources, it's through collaborative activity among our institutions of higher education, not head-to-head -head competition. Speaker of the House, Roger Hanshaw is with us on the program. Bill, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I, uh, I, that is, that's commendable, and that's, the, that's aspirational goals. But in reality, uh, there is competition. There has to be competition. And the two larger schools are, are research and teaching uh, with a lot of research, whereas the smaller schools, the other 18 that would consider both the four-year and two-year, are mostly uh, uh, teaching uh, or vocational training. Uh, how do you balance the, the needs and the requirements requirements of these two disparate group of, of universities? Well, I, I think you have to just simply not compare them. And I say that because it's, it's, a, complete, it's a complete paradigm shift in, in mission mandate, right? So WVU is an R1 research university. We, we, we want it to be engaged in that kind of activity. It's a land-grant institution, and by its charter, it's, it's supposed to be engaged in service, teaching, and research 
on behalf of all 55 counties of West Virginia. That, that's, that's its mission. So that's fundamentally different than every other, every other college, university, secondary institution, post-secondary institution in the state. And that, that's by design. That's how it's supposed to be. Immediately, immediately beneath that is every, every other institution that engages in a completely different kind of mission. And I think the question about what kind of support we offer, how we, what kind of flexibility we offer, uh, all, all flow from what the mission mandates are for those institutions. Take, take for example, a Glenville State University right in the middle of the state where, where, I, where I live. So Glenville State College is not in my district, but it's very near it, and it serves a very different mission than, than say, Shepherd, than, say, WVU, than, than, say, Marshall. It caters to a largely regional audience, and it does so to fill largely a training and educational need for workforce development in the communities that it serves. And in that case, maybe we have the same workforce need in every region of West Virginia. And if we do, then I think it's appropriate that we offer the same kind of training programs at each institution that serves all those various regions. But we, we likely do not need multiple chemical engineering programs in West Virginia. The, the, the demand doesn't support that. But we likely do need multiple teacher education programs in West Virginia because every county in the state has a demand for those professionals. So I think it's that kind of an analysis. Well, Roger, I, I think you know the view from 10,000 feet is, and I applaud your point, that the, it's time for some of these schools to have some uh, self-reflection in terms of uh, the, the, whether there's a continued demand for their services, enrollment might be declining, things of that nature. So they got to look inside the institution to see what they need to do. But also the view from 10,000 feet is that the legislature, adjusted for inflation, has cut higher education funding by about 25% over the last 10 years. Is that a trend that you think will continue, or is that some self-reflection that the legislature has to do in terms of supporting these uh, institutions? So, no, that's not a trend that will continue, full stop. That is not a trend that will continue. Some of what you're, I think, citing there, Admiral, goes back to, I believe, probably 2015, when the state found itself having to immediately cut $500 million a year with, uh, with very little warning. So higher education did bear the brunt of that or, or did bear certainly a disproportionate share of that. And the, the days in which we had to make those kind of sacrifices, at least for the time being, are behind us. And I, I for one, am really happy that that's the case. Uh, that's good to hear. Speaker Roger Hanshaw, our guest on the program. Soon you folks will gather for the next interim session, which could turn into a special session. Do you have any indication at all at this time, Mr. Speaker, whether or not the governor will indeed make this also into a special session? So what, what the governor has said publicly, Rob, is that, that if there is agreement among among his staff and, and the, in both houses of the legislature uh, on what what should be done, then he will issue a call for us to come in and do that. Uh, I, I've not met with the governor in the last last week or so. Uh, I expect to, to meet with him between now and the interim session to talk about whether there is agreement from his side and ours on these on, on some of these issues, some of the ones we just discussed today. Uh, I think there's a likelihood that he will do that, but we do not yet have a call, no. Have you, in preparation for this, had discussions with Senate President Blair? Well, Senator Blair and I talk several times each week, whether we're headed into a special session or even contemplating one or not. We, we talk several times a week just in the course of running the government. I like that. I actually like to hear that. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, that little bit of information there. Senator Blair and I talk fairly well uh, and regularly and routinely as well, I would say. <laughs> in, in regard to running the government. <laughs> Not in regards to running the government, no. In regards to getting on the program. And Mr. Speaker, thanks so much for your time this morning. Any final thoughts? No, gentlemen, thanks for having me this morning. Have a good day. You thanks too, Roger. Speaker Bye. Roger Hanshaw at 9 o'clock and almost 9.01, actually. The segment brought to you in part by Hagerstown Ford.